morning. <laughs> Beatboxing. <laughs> Nobody's laughing. <laughs> hey, are you awake? Yeah. Yes. How about we all get up? Do like uh, 10 jumping jacks. Okay? <laughs> Alright, so, so we are Biohackers Handbook and uh, we're going to look into the nutrition a little bit but we're also going to look into sleep and the mind and the work. So I think everyone who is very busy today working through their day needs a little bit of advice on all of these different fronts on how, what can you really do. So I'm the technology specialist in writing this book and then we have the Hi, I'm Olli Sobjärvi, medical doctor, uh, mainly uh, responsible of the science aspect of the book and also going through all the references, which is pretty extensive, but I, I actually love it because I learned quite a bit in the process. Yeah, it's definitely a learning process for all of us and uh, my name is Jaakko Halmettaja, I'm a nutrition guy around this subject, but of course excited about all the other aspects of health and well-being but yeah nice to be here so the book that we have been writing is has become quite a phenomenon in Finland we have been in the media since the inception of the writing process uh, almost every week in radio TV newspapers um, making the biohacking term known in, in mass media we have given over a hundred presentation within the last year uh, together we have number one podcast on iTunes, on the health category and also alternative health. And we've been doing some events uh, uh, and sharing the knowledge, not just in Finland, but in Estonia, in Sweden, in, in Spain, in Germany, and so on. And actually our DJ comes out of one of those uh, trips where I met. He promised to scratch if I beatbox. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right, we'll do it later. <laughs> So, Come on. So, so in this book we have um, five chapters and we have already released Sleep and Mind. These are in Finnish, it's coming out in English next year. And now we have released uh, yesterday the nutrition chapter and it's 169 pages, one chapter uh, in this case and 472 references actually. So it's quite massive amount of work that goes into looking into how can you upgrade yourself uh, with latest biological and technological tools. In all of these books we look into the different systems that are relevant to understand. For example with sleep you might want to look into different phases of the sleep. Then we go into the methods and technologies, how you can affect uh, for example alpha waves or whatever you want to want to influence once you understand what you are trying to influence with and, and based on the latest science. But really, I mean we are all individuals, there is all kinds of genetical differences so and uh, epigenetical and lifestyle and all of this. So you have to measure and figure out what really works in your case. So we look into the quantified self aspects in there. And the relationship between quantified self and biohacking, the way how we see it is basically that uh, biohacking is the hypothesis. It's about your aspiration of what you want to become in the future and what kind of things you want to perhaps do. Let's say you, are, you have this idea that maybe if I exercise more, if I lose weight, maybe I will be more alert, maybe I get more done, maybe I have more energy, more, maybe my reaction time is better, whatever it is, then the question is, are you getting real effects when you do all kinds of things with diet or exercise and so on? So then that, that's the quantified self part. It's about gathering information and understanding if you are having real effects and that helps you to map yourself. And once you do that, you actually learn from the data, you learn from the map itself, you start to use the map on your own life. And, and what we have learned, all of us here on stage, Oli is a doctor, but he's been hacking himself like, I mean, what is your well philosophy? Well over 10 years. What is your philosophy of being a doctor? I mean, can you treat people uh, without doing this yourself? No. Uh, that's basically upgrading the doc. So I have to first treat myself and understand how all the uh, physiology and mind and put it all together how it works. 
So uh, for me, it was like a culmination point when I did over 100 hours per week, like intensive care job for five years. So it, I realized that it's not going to get me anywhere and right. I can't treat people if I just do the prescription and five minutes you're in and out. How about Jaakko, you, you know, my understanding of your background is also that you didn't, you, you were not born as a nutrition specialist, so there must have been some yeah. kind of learning there. Well, I have a pretty strong athletic background and that was a big angle for everything that I did, of course. If you exercise, you need to sleep, you need to recover, your focus on good food and stuff like that, but that basically didn't have anything to do with health. And that was a big discovery for me that I was training really hard. I used to wrestle and do martial arts and stuff like that. And when I first get into a large or a wide array of blood analyses and stuff like that, I realized that, whoa, everything that I've been doing and just thinking that I get enough magnesium, whatever, wasn't that much true. So you are what you eat, it's not true. You are what you absorb, is true. And so those kinds of ideas um, started the big process for me. And of course, when you get the effects and you realize that, whoa, this was something that I um, kind of um, was lacking. I didn't know that you can actually feel that good every day. And I was um, getting towards those goals by some other ways. And, and that's been so exciting journey for I think seven years now I've been really focusing on health and not so much to just how do I bench press more or whatever. So that's definitely the hero's journey happening here. So whatever ideas you have, whatever you read, all the theories out there, you have to figure out if those have real life effects and uh, you are the test subject here. And I want to bring out an idea here. In, in, in scientific research, what we do, we try to control placebo effect, for example, and we try to isolate parameters and figure out what has a real effect. And, and that's the scientific uh, method. It's, it's, it's very vigorous work. But then when you are applying something on your own, that's a very subjective experience. Very hard to make in an objective way. You can do placebo controlled studies on yourself by, for example, you have your, your spouse or your, your girlfriend or boyfriend can, for example, administer you the whatever pills or food uh, so that half of that is placebo and then measure and you have one parameter. But what I want to say is that good luck trying to figure out every parameter. Uh, you, you're going to spend your rest of your life looking at para single parameters. You don't have enough time. So one of the biohacker things is that you try to figure out what is the like the 20% that's out there that has any likelihood of actually working. So out of the scientific material. So from a theoretical perspective, has any likelihood of working. Then you apply all of that on yourself. And, uh, and once you see some effects coming out, you can test in different ways, cognitive tests and so on, if there are some effects happening. And when you start to take parameters out, you start to see when something breaks up. And this is what I saw with inflammation, for example, when I healed myself. It's not one pill, it's not one thing that reduces inflammation, it's not one thing that, uh, that does it, but it's a combination of things. And this complexity of what it means to be human is, is really crucial here. So it's not like there is no single magic silver bullet for any, any kind of situation. So Yeah, uh, that's exactly right. I would add here that uh, you have to become aware of yourself. Many, many of my patients, many people, they have no idea what's going on in their bodies or in their minds. Their mind is like a racing circus. It's like all the time, non-stop thinking, and they have no idea that it's happening. They have no idea often that's what's happening in their body if, if they are not connected. So becoming aware is like the first part. First step, yeah. right on. Okay, let's, let's dive into uh, some of the aspects that you can do during your day. And we're going to start with nutrition. And talking about nutrition, talking about diets, for example, uh, is, is something where you have to take the individual things into, into account. I'm going to hand over to Jaakko because he's more of an expert on this stuff. I really like this picture. <laughs> there is something, something to that individual aspect of all of us. And I think it's really interesting to do these experiments, for example, 
I just got my recent blood analysis from uh, Tallinn actually where it's really cheap to cheap to do do this analysis and um, I was experimenting um, about you know can I raise my cholesterol kind of too much by eating a lot of eggs and stuff like that because I know that genetically I have this uh, APO4E ally which is like a 20% of Finnish people have that ally so my cholesterol metabolism doesn't work in a normal way like most of the people. So it's really interesting to see these uh, individual patterns and, and stuff that is happening which really makes pretty big, big uh, difference in the way that we do our thing, how we are putting together our diet, our personal diet. So there's so many of these little variants that it's, it's nice to actually know and quantify what are your personal angles towards nutrition and then try to put it together with the best ingredients possible. And this is a big angle in our book that it's not just that we are eating terms, that we are eating, you know, an apple, we are eating just meat, but what kind of meat? Because there's so much, um, so much aspect what makes actually that effects in our body. Is it just an basic olive oil and actually half of that is sunflower or whatever? Or is it a really high quality extra virgin olive oil that has all the good polyphenols and all that that nobody is talking about? Just how much omega 3 or whatever. So there are so many variables in every food that we are eating and then what our own metabolism and stuff like that is needing. That we really need to get to the core and go with the best quality ingredients and then try to really hack that what are our own needs. So we are individuals in many ways. Absolutely. For sure. Where did you do your genetical testing? I think I did that um, like a year, maybe two years ago, when 23 and me came out. 23 and me, yeah. 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 yeah, so it's like $99 or something like this. But nowadays they don't provide you the sort of health uh, data more ancestral data, but you can download it and you can upload it to another service that tells you once again uh, some of these things. So if you want to figure out if you have Demo. some problems, I have a confession. Fat me metabolism. Tell me. I've had it over uh, one year and a half in my shelf, the 23 and me test. You haven't done it? No. Oh <laughs> You're not going to Biohackers Heaven or something. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> there's this, uh, of course, ethical uh, aspect. How much do you want to really know? Uh, what do you do with the information? Uh, I'm going to do it for sure, but mm. I didn't yeah. feel it. But as we can see here, the sequencing is, is getting cheaper and cheaper. You can do it in also in Tallinn, but also we have Woblab here. So now we have some cheaper genetical testing and, and products available in, in Finland as well. And I, I've done some of, some of my own, own tests, and I know that I don't have the APOE4 uh, uh, allele uh, gene that often is related to problems with fat metabolism, especially uh, cholesterol. But in my case, um, the, the, what I see there uh, is I have some increased risk for diabetes, for example. So I want to really look into that my blood sugar values are not going like this, like crazy, but trying to keep them a bit more steady. And the other thing that I'm looking into is vitamin D. I know that it doesn't absorb very well, and I confirmed that from genetical testing and also from uh, lab tests. So I have to take like 20 times more than normally people have to take it during, during winter time and uh, to get even to the level of... of, of How about that recommendation, say 800 I use? No, is no, that, that enough? Much, 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 yeah. much more. Much more. So, so that this is the results from um, some of these tests. Uh, it's a screenshot, but yeah. when I test with blood tests, this is no way, no way, no uh, way. Do you, know, do you know what's the official recommendation for vitamin D in Finland? Mila does at least. <laughs> well, it's 400 IUs, which is like 10 micrograms. Uh, I've seen that nearly 80% of the people don't, they don't get uh, high enough vitamin D levels with that dose. So it's not enough. I don't know why it's the recommendation is like that, but... I actually know, and it's because they have the most science that backs up the health effects of vitamin D is the marker, biomarker of your bone density. So every one of you know that vitamin D plays a crucial role for your immune system, diabetes, all, all kinds of stuff, but they are not taking that data in, in those recommendations because it's just too much work. And of course, everyone can, 
you know, cross-reference all the data and get the point that, yeah, it might, might be a good idea to, to keep your vitamin D levels a bit, bit higher. It's very hard to research these things. I mean, vitamin D affects like about 300 different genes and not all genes are on all the time. And depending on of, 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 uh, epigenetics, environmental things, your lifestyle, some things, some of the protein synthesis might be on or off. And uh, that's pretty interesting because I mean, that also relates to nutrient deficiencies. Yes, uh, actually vitamin D is a hormone uh, it has, a, has an effect over 200 genes. So it's, it's functioning like a major hormone. Uh, so it's, it's like a huge impact on our health. Yeah. yeah. But l looking into food, we can, we can perhaps generalize some, some perspectives of how to address like, for example, micronutrient deficiencies that are rampant uh, all over the world. Uh, that's, that's at least what we know. Well, I think that most of the people are just eating food that contains macronutrients. And we're just talking about that, how much protein or how much carbohydrates or whatever. But nobody's having an insurance, basically. I think that in that way. Because nobody's eating food that has even the slightest medicinal value anymore. And I think we had a pretty good um, dinner yesterday where we used, you know, shiitake mushrooms, we used a lot of berries, stuff that actually has that power, it has more bitter flavors, more colors. These compounds that are actually not working in our bodies in a dosage that is toxic, but in a dosage that is medicinal. And I think that's a pretty, pretty significant statement, but we need to go towards that, not in the, the other direction too far that we are getting those toxic effects. That's not something that we want to do. But people are now eating just macronutrients because all the plants are basically genetically um, domesticated to lack all of these more bitter, more strong compounds and, and that's, that's a big mistake in, in our time, I think. Yeah. In our book we, we reference a source that says that in the world we have about 40,000 edible plants, probably more, but in any case uh, we cultivate a very small amount of those um, and the top 10 so-called stale foods are responsible for about 90% of calorie intake worldwide. So that, those are things like wheat and uh, corn, rice. rice and these kind of things. So not very nutrient dense. So we have been able to, through breeding techniques, increase, let's say, sugars that we love as taste and take the bitter taste out. And bitter taste is where the nutrients are. So eat your spices. Yeah, right? and that's not a bad, bad thing. That's not a bad thing, but uh, you need to realize that at the same time, if we only eat food like that, that's a bit problematic. So there is a balance between these things. We of course need those stable foods to get, you know, just calories and good stuff like that, that is not so um, easily available in nature. If we went all wild foods, we realized really quickly, and there are not too many calories out here, but there are lots of nutrients and medicinal compounds in there. So we need to really get that balance back within those groups. What kind of decisions would you do in a supermarket? Well, I think that the, a few good navigators for all of the people is just color, taste, and vig vigority of, of plants and stuff like that. So in basically every category, for example, I would go towards berries much rather than, you know, fruits. That's a good example. It's much less domesticated. There are much more nutrients and much, uh, much uh, less any, any possible allergies or, or, or reactions like that. And they are widely available everywhere. So a really simple upgraded go towards berries rather than, you know, bananas and stuff like that. That is pretty highly cultivated. And just in general, like in greens, choose those really dark green leafy ones, not the basic, basically transparent one that doesn't have any nutrients. Just has a bit of fiber and stuff like that, but that doesn't really do much in your body. Yeah, I have a short comment on the micronutrients. Uh, there's a professor called Bruce Ames. He has this triage theory of micronutrients, micronutrients and aging. And his theory uh, says that if you are micronutrient deficient all of your life, the reserves are going to be from the liver, uh, not, not from the heart, but from other organs. 
So if you don't follow, uh, if you don't get them from the diet, you're gonna use them from your intestinal organs. So you probably don't the, see in a couple of years any problems. No, that's right? that's like many many tens of years. Yeah, of yeah. And then you suddenly just yeah. fall dead. So <laughs> follow, following like very colorful, very nutrient dense foods, you get to meet like the micro micronutrient uh, needs and you're more likely to have a longer life. Mm. You'll be avoiding off uh, all those degenerative dis diseases. Yeah, I think it's, there are actually just a few simple markers in a diet that the scientist has found from these, studying these blue zones, which are the zones in a world that people really have a, a much longer um, percent to have a long lifespan, like 100 years or so. And there are just a few variables, and one is uh, high pigmentation. So they have really wide array of strongly pigmented, you know, vegetables, berries, stuff like that. And they also eat fermented food. I find this that really fascinating because we have a long chapter about the microbiome and, and about the gut health as a hacked system in our book. And, and that's a really crucial part that almost nobody is eating nowadays. You know, sauerkraut, fermented foods, to really feed those friendly bacteria in your gut. And that same process actually happens in, on our skin, in our mouth. So it's a, all about the bacteria, actually. Absolutely. So the perspective that we take into diet is actually we bring a new perspective that is not in the conversation right now, which is very much like, you know, looking at what's on the plate and the portions and percentages and all of that. But we look into the quality. So it's not, you know, one, one piece of meat is not the same thing as another one. So, so it really does matter if it's wild game or some farm grown, corn fed, antibiotics, you know, infested uh, piece of meat that's vacuum packed uh, and, and sold on the, on the supermarket. So you may want to look into the individual food categories, but also going a little bit deeper into the spectrum of, of colors and tastes and, and so on. So basically you can upgrade everything. It doesn't matter whether it's meat or vegetables or... Or fats. Or fats. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of fat conversation. Especially fats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So and that, then it's so... so um, the science is so different. For example, when we looked at the, you know, processed meat and all the studies around that, it's a really terrible thing for your body and the planet and all that. But when we look at the studies done with, you know, wild, you know, bison or whatever, it actually lowers inflammation in your body and stuff like that. So you can't say that something does something if you are not considering the quality markers, because that's all that matters. If I have a piece of meat on my plate, I don't see those studies talking about processed meat does this and that because it's a so different thing. And that is something that we need to consider in every single food category. Yeah, if you take, for example, the meat as an example, the population studies on cancer and meat and the connection of red meat and so on probably doesn't take into account how the meat was processed, how it was cooked, for example. Uh, is it burned with all kinds of carcinogens on, or is it like slowly cooked on a crockpot method or whatever. Yeah, or even pizza can be meat because there is some meat in the pizza. So there's like these confounding factors or hot dog or something like yeah, that. Yeah. So, so it's, it's very hard to do studies on this, but you can study yourself. You can look at your, mi your macronutrient intake, your micronutrients intake, but the intake is not what matters here. It's, it's what really absorbs. So what gets into use, that's what we are interested in, so what actually ends up in your body. So we have differences in, I have higher iron absorption, for example, I have to avoid red meat slightly because of that reason. Uh, so looking at the lab test, looking into what's, what's going on there, uh, that gives you a map, a navigator of, of in what direction you may want to go into. And this is now like, I, I also went to Tallinn, it was like six tubes of blood and I was almost fainting while I was crawling myself to the restaurant for lunch. Man, you need some iron. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, so uh, but, but soon you can do it from one, one drop of blood and you can most likely do it at home or while you are giving blood, uh, which I recommend many of you to do, especially men, if you have high iron. So. Soon you will be able to look at some of the markers at home, so you don't have to go to the doctor's office, uh, or do I have influenza, you know, or is it a bacteria or whatever, you know, let's take antibiotics just in case. But you can actually look at home, 
do I have influenza or, or is it something else? Uh, and uh, you can look at your hormonal levels, you can look if, you know, let's say your lack of energy is because of high cortisol, low testosterone, whatever it is, inflammation markers, these kind of things. Are, should you be really worried when you're a little bit sick, you know, uh, or you have chest pain or something like this? So right now, a lot of people, they measure blood pressure at home. They don't go to doctor's office to overload those guys. Soon you can do all kinds of things at home without overloading the, the general establishment with all kinds of tests. About 40% of some of these private hospitals, the costs of running it goes into all the all kinds of testing and the work that the yeah, doctors that's, do. Yeah, that's absolutely true, but of course it needs education. Uh, I don't... <laughs> I have no idea how many people actually realize what's in like the influenza marker or HRCRP or, or interleukin-6. So um, they're on both sides. So we need like some perfect uh, basic education about how to do it yourself. Of course, uh, measuring blood pressure, it's very simple. And yeah. it's been, it's what, been like... What I noticed years. when I started doing it myself, when I got the interest, what does interleukin-1 or 6 mean actually? And when I start looking at, you know, cholesterol and LDL, HDL, triglycerides, uh, apo, apolipoprotein B and, and these kind of things, what I discovered was that actually many of the doctors or nurses don't even look at all the holistic markers and, and take the whole thing into account. They just look at total cholesterol or something and That's then the they're problem. worried about it. So educate yourself about what the lab tests are. So if they say, yeah, there was liver values were a little bit high, otherwise normal. So Try to study, you know, what those markers might mean. Because also, if you go to another country, suddenly you are totally healthy. Uh, in another country, you are totally sick based on those. Because those are based on population averages. Um, so figure out your your genome, figure out your your current status quo, and and you'll be much better off. Figure out your poop. Poop. Yeah, that's Next. that's extremely important because of the microbiome. I mean, you can tell uh, uh, shortly how that affects the brain, for example. Yeah, so uh, it's basically a uh, two-way communication between the enteric nervous system and the brain. So uh, I'm sure many of you have like the feeling you have butterflies in the gut, you know, that feeling a little bit nervous. It's a, a straight message from the brain to your stomach. And of course it goes uh, the other way around. If you have stomach problems and it's like don't feel it, that well bloating affects your brain. So that's like basically how it works. Of course, it's more complicated as, as an effect on hormones, even the HPA axis, which uh, regulates the stress control. So it's, it's all interconnected. And gut permeability, so-called leaky gut, can re result also into inflammation in the blood-brain barrier. And, and yeah, so it can be like a leaky brain. So that's why many people have brain fog. They have a problem in the gut, which is a reflection to the brain. That was the problem with the writing process. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's why it was so fast. I think most of the people in here are really interested about improving your cognitive skills and stuff like that. And for me, I think it was a kind of turning point to realize that, for example, over 90% of um, these neurotransmitters that most of the people have heard, dopamine and GABA and serotonin and stuff like that, are produced in our gut. So the whole thing that why to hack the gut is really about how you feel. So just to put that out there. So there is more foreign DNA uh, in our body influencing the different process. So we are in a symbiotic relationship with those guys in our guts. And imagine what happens if you put antibiotics one after another and two generations after another. What happens to the offspring? What happens to you know these kids who have autism and all kinds of depression and stuff happening? Maybe there is a problem right there. Yeah. Uh, how, how many did you actually know that one antibiotic uh, treatment can uh, destroy over 30 percent of your gut bacteria? So that's quite a bit. I hear stories like okay, I have like seven sinuitis and I have seven antibiotic treatment. So you can uh, imagine what it does to your gut bacteria. Yeah. So you can test Ubiome, it's a US-based company, or Wellbiome, which is, by the way, from Estonia. We have some Estonian friends over here. So check out that. I think we have to speed up a little bit. But okay, let's talk a little bit faster. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Now. So this is the kitchen, and uh, it's a very upgraded one. So 
in anything you operate, just start to look into the basic things you use over and over again in your kitchen, in your bedroom, in your workroom. The things that you do all the time, those are the areas where you want to operate something. And one thing that I recommend you to do is get rid of the Teflon pans, get titanium, ceramic, glass, something else that is less likely to leak all kinds of toxic stuff into the food that you produce. You may want to explore a little bit more advanced methods like sous vide cooking under vacuum. I'm personally waiting for this device. It's called Mellow. Same. And it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, the, the problem with um, this, this sous vide thing is that I'm, I'm a very late waker in the morning. So I, I, I'm, I'm always in a hurry. You know, I, I use every hour I can. And late. Yeah, absolutely. And you know that. So <laughs> the thing is that if I want to do perfect eggs in the morning, so that it's perfectly al dente, the, the, the whites and the, uh, the yolks, I would have to put it into this kind of machinery for, for 68 degrees for one hour. And frankly, I'm not awake, you know, one hour before I eat. So it's usually a couple of minutes uh, from waking up to eating. So with this device, I could time it with my phone. And it's actually a fridge during the night. So it's keeping the eggs cool or room temperature. And then it starts to increase the temperature. And it's, uh, it's ready when I, when I wake up. But, but normally, this is what I do. I mean, I throw stuff into the blender. Uh, during summer, uh, there's different wild herbs. Uh, this is one of the shelves I have. There's actually more of those shelves all, all around the place. And uh, that's where I combine different things. If you, if you don't want to do this, try Ambronite. I mean, it's one bag, and it has a lot of the stuff that I, I've been doing myself. So you've been doing a lot of these uh, smoothies for, for quite some time. So what is your like, quick tip? Yeah, I think the easiest one is to really add some berries and the amount is somewhere around like 150 to 200 grams. So that's kind of the sweet spot when we are actually getting those medicinal effects to lower your blood pressure or whatever. For example, blueberries or bilberries more specifically, a few hundred grams. And then we can throw like a more strong green powders and stuff like that to really energize our cells. So that's kind of the real energy drink, I think, rather than caffeine or something that is pretty much giving a stress reaction to our body and then we get more um, um, enhanced, um, how would I put it? Well, anyway, you get the point. Yeah. So greens are the main way to go for everyone interested in, in uh, health and energy. So I think that that's a really great combination. Berries to cover those more bitter flavors and stuff like that. And the secret ingredients in is avocados, for sure. I've operated a few smoothie bars in Tampere for years, and there is nothing like avocados. You need to really get good avocados, and throw that half an avocado to a blender, and you get that smooth texture, some berries, some cream powders, maybe a bit of honey. That's a good way to go. Always Would you say that yeah. avocado is perfect food? I always tell that is uh, my patient, if, if they need like to have a snack, have an avocado with salt, good salt, and some lemon. That's like perfect. And if you need brain. to ripen them, ripen them off, because this is a big problem for people, of course. Like, eat me now, eat me now. Too late. Like, <laughs> that's that's a, so so put a, them be, um, next to, for example, bananas, because they use this uh, ethylene gas to ripen up bananas, and that's the same chemical that is also ripening avocados. So you can basically hack that ripening also. Mm. And if you think these things taste horrible, you'd rather have your sandwich in the morning, try a little bit of salt, a little bit of vinegar, and a little bit of lemon. Lemon is the magic tool in every kitchen for every chef. You put it into any food and it starts to taste great. So, um, and uh, if you, if you want to go really advanced with this, uh, this stuff, can you... Oh, Turn it on. Back. <laughs> then you're gonna go like this. That's gonna. <laughs> this, this is this is the more advanced stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So you may want to also start experimenting with absolutely amazing desserts, uh, raw ingredients, not cooked or anything like this. This can be really powerful. We made some absolutely amazing matcha gyver. So if MacGyver did an ice cream with matcha, the matcha gyver recipe yesterday for upgrade dinner, I'm going to post that into the 
event blog, by the way, tomorrow. So check it out. Uh, it's full of fats. I eat that for breakfast. I eat for lunch. I eat for dinner. It's the best. That's all you eat. That's, That's why you're so small. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's why I have iron. That's why you're so, so smart. <laughs> yeah. But I think that we're living in the age where it's not Im anymore like, like no pain, no gain. And we need to suffer to get held. It's more like no brain, no gain, just pain. <laughs> so we have so much to upgrade. Whatever is the, the problem, whether there is was coffee or chocolate or whatever, we can get not just a bit of uh, dark chocolate. No, so ridiculous options in that category that it just, I'm so grateful living in this time. So just like we said, you know, everything you do regularly, eat, drink coffee, sleep, you know, sit in a chair, look for a better option for yourself. So great quality beans is a good investment. Don't buy the cheapest stuff. Don't buy readily grinded coffee because that's already oxidized and it's not good for you. You want to buy the beans roasted very recently. That's what we have here. It's roasted on Thursday, I think. And um, use these things strategically, not like a habit every morning, a cup of coffee to get on, but you know, strategically think about when you use those tools and you can use also spices with these kind of things. So it's not just, you know, being a purist and only drinking coffee black, but maybe putting a little bit of cinnamon in it after one hour of eating something because when the blood uh, uh, sugar goes up, you can use cinnamon, especially the one that has the coumarin in it, which is toxic to the liver, but <laughs> actually lowers the blood sugar. Uh, so, or you can use spices during winter time to, you know, uh, a little bit of uh, heat and so on. But uh, to move on into work and the mind, so these things are very much related. If you don't eat a proper diet, I mean, your brain is not going to function either. But also what we do every day, like we sit in chairs today as knowledge workers, our metabolism is, is, is totally, if you let me, allow me, use my friends, fucked up. So what are you doing when you try to change Well, I think that um, as a knowledge worker, I've been doing so much stuff on a computer that at early point I was thinking about, if I do this like 10 hours a day, I really need to figure out how to do this in the long run. And the best tools that I've found is actually this Sully, Sully system, the chair that is not putting any pressure to my genital area. And I think that's actually a pretty significant factor that most of the people don't think about. How little pressure we need to really block our veins. There are all these big veins in, in our um, body right here and, and if we get stuck that, that doesn't do much good if we eat some uh, like a chocolate or whatever to keep our, our um, metabolism healthy if we're just stuck for hours and hours. And so get the pressure off and of course do, do um, standing work if, if that's possible. Uh, hang and uh, those mini trampolines are just super excellent for your cell metabolism. So there is that Bellicon one. I really recommend those ones to do have those, what it's called. So it's not a metallic spring, but those, whatever. There's you know. actually a huge difference. I have this basic mini trampoline in my home. I, I, I thought it was very good, but when I've tried that Bellicon, <laughs> there's like a huge difference. Yeah. So or use micro breaks and do something like that. Or a vibration plate. I mean, that's, that's also an amazing tool. Um, or you can do a seven minute workout. Yeah. Scientifically proven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, it's not seven minutes. It's like eight and a half or something, but it, it or was double. on New York Times. But it's, it's really great. You don't have to go to the gym to exercise. Uh, regularly and, and stay fit and lean and free. You can do it wherever you want, you know, between meetings and, and that's what I, I prefer to do is, is, is quick, quick uh, high intensity interval training kind of sessions. And I looked at my, my, my uh, genes as well for this and I have a very high injury risk but I also recover very fast and uh, so for me this kind of uh, heavy, heavy short interval training is, is actually pretty, pretty good. Um, stress is something that we deal all, you know, by, you can over-exercise obviously, but in today's work we are constantly activating a little bit too much, perhaps uh, the, the, what is the axis? 
it's HP8, it's hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenals. So that's like basically uh, the stress response and uh, controlling between your brain and the adrenals who produce the cortisol. So it can be like fucked up, <laughs> like most people have. So the regulation between the brain and, and the adrenals doesn't work anymore. So you produce cortisol and even more cortisol and even more. And then, then you can e even have like resistance in the cell level. So it's, you have cortisol receptor resistance. Th that's like same you have uh, like insulin resistance, which is like pre-diabetic situation. But this can also lead to like huge problems, even diabetes. Yeah. So uh, you can actually measure your daily cortisol levels uh, from the saliva. Mm -hmm. You can get this uh, nice curve, which you should have like high, high cortisol in the morning and then lower and very low in the evening. Cortisol has like this kind of bad reputation, but actually you need that stuff to wake up in the morning. So you want to have some cortisol definitely, but not too much. And, and one thing that can increase, you know, your stress level is obviously to drink too much uh, in the evening, not sleep well because of that and get hangover and all of that, you know, the lifestyle we live in a, in a pretty corporate world. So you can hack, you know, these kind of situations. So being a biohacker doesn't mean you never drink or you only eat, you know, green spirulina powder in excess amounts like you do. But <laughs> it's, it's something where you can strategically use different situations. And I mean, this evening we're going to have some drinks and we definitely made sure that some of those drinks have some strategies for making sure that doesn't cause you as heavy hangover as it can. Wish we had it yesterday. Um, so um, <laughs> with with some of these techniques over here, you can support your liver to break down acetaldehyde. That is the primary cause of hangover effects. But um, also during you know, your day, when you are stressed out, there are some great adaptogenic herbs like... Uh, yeah, rhodiola or rose root is a big one here in the north. And of course, there are a few other ones like rishi mushroom and, and stuff like that. And I think Christopher has those tinctures somewhere around there. So that's something that I do regularly and I think most of the guys also. So you just basically put a dropper full under your tongue to get the instant absorption of those things. And I think rhodiola is one that has basically the most clinical research behind it. And in Sweden, they are really hacking or, or getting more insights about the mechanisms that, that how these affect the HPA axis and all that. So something to look up to, adaptogenic herbs. That's something I use nearly daily basis. Of course, I rotate it. I don't use it every time. But if I'm in a high stress situation, I clearly notice the effects of the rhodiola. So it's, I also uh, prescribe it to my patients. Yeah, and uh, I mean, you don't need to use these kind of tools. You can use just meditation. It's, it's proven to change your brain physically, <laughs> rewire things. And uh, I mean, as a biohacker, you might want to look into having a space where you do these things, but you don't really need to be in a lotus position, listening to some, uh, uh, looking at mandalas and having some, someone playing a tra uh, kind of a, putting you into a trance with a drum or something. Actually, uh, the lotus position is it's pretty bad because it, uh, <laughs> the, the veins are, uh, the, the circulation and the veins, it's, it's stuck. Yeah. But you can do this in a bus in the morning. You know, look at the other guys there. I think they're all meditating. Though. You can levitate. Oh, <laughs> yeah. But benefits of meditation, I mean, stress reduction, uh, reduction of anxiety, depression, all the physical, not just uh, psychological, but physiological effects as well are there, reduced blood pressure, improved brain blood circulation, uh, reduced oxidative stress. Yeah, cortisol levels, even pulse. Uh, many of my patients have like high, high uh, resting pulse. So that's basically uh, because of the autonomic nervous system and the sympathetic system is highly activated. So if you get like a resting pulse uh, down by 10, that's a huge impact. So meditation does that also. For me, it's like 43. If I drop the 10 more, I think I'm done. Passed. <laughs> so um, there are different styles of meditation, and the school of style of meditation also affects what happens in your brain. So you can actually, this, this you can train your brain. You can train your brain. You can change your brain. And this device that I'm using is a brain training device called Muse. Um, if you want to try it out, 
um, probably during the break. There's a couple of opportunities for that. Um, news is uh, perhaps also going to be at Biohacker Summit next year. And then the last thing, sleep. I mean, remember to recover. Sleep is essential for your physical performance, for your mental performance, for your health. Lack of sleep increases inflammation, leads to all kinds of modern diseases like diabetes and heart disease and all of these things. Don't go there. Try to get enough sleep. I didn't get for the last two weeks because of organizing this conference. So in life, we have these situations when we just don't have the opportunity for it. You have small kids or whatever that are keeping you up. So, um, but you can look into how can you, if you have only a couple of hours so that you really get high quality sleep. So look at the deep sleep, how, how much you are getting deep sleep, how quality deep sleep that is. There is great products out there. Bedit has one, Emfit has one. This is some of my recent data from Emfit that I, that I looked at. Um, I've been a little bit uh, running on an overdrive. This is actually a measurement after a week of not sleeping much. So this is a recovery night on the weekend. So yeah, but you still have a low heart rate, which is pretty yeah. good. So my resting heart rate has not increased. I've done all kinds of hacking. But take the naps if you can. And drinking coffee might be a good idea just before napping, because it takes a little bit of time before it, it really hits into your bloodstream. So um, that's, uh, that's, that's one of the tricks. So you can be <coughs> much more alert once you wake up from the nap. And, Sleep for 20 minutes or 90 minutes. If you sleep something in between, you produce adenosine. You, you, you dip, dip, uh, dip into the deep uh, phases of sleep. Yeah. And uh, you are a bit drowsy when you wake up, so it's, it's not nice. So 20 or 90, so hit those targets. Upgrade your bedroom. Look at the lights. Look at the materials. Look at the air quality. One of the best biohacks I did was an air purifier. Same here. Sort. Yeah, It's a really big issue, especially in Finland. I think that last year there was a big conference about the air quality in Finland and what the conclusion was that outside the air in Finland is the purest in the world, but inside is almost the worst because all the buildings are built in such a hurry with the super low grade uh, materials and they don't breathe and so that's a big problem in Finland. So really think about that. You don't know how many health related companies or places I've been to like uh, um, institutions that have probably the worst air quality. I mean, these guys are dealing with our health. Yeah, think about the like, situ situation. You have, a, you have a conference or, or a meeting, and you have a very bad air. People are like, <gasps> you're yawning. That's actually because you're opening your alveoles in your lungs. So that's like natural reaction to get more oxygen into your brain. Yeah, so, and then the blue light. I mean, we are looking at computer screens when we go to sleep. There is a artificial sun staring at your eyes, telling your biology it's day and you're not producing the melatonin. And when you try to go to sleep, it takes like an hour before it kicks in. So try to avoid this kind of daylight uh, lengths uh, uh, of, of light. And, and you can block that. There are computer software like Flux. There are the light blocking glasses if you're a biohacker. I just got myself a Philips Hue. It's pretty cool. I can change the lights like here uh, in the evening and uh, have li li a little bit less um, uh, that, that kind of light that I usually like to use during the day. But let's, let's you know, wrap up, right? Yeah. Let's wrap up. So, Oli, where, where are you heading? I mean, uh, <laughs> how would you develop yourself from here on? Yeah, so uh, this is from the mind chapter. Uh, this basically means that we have different uh, lines of development we can develop ourselves and there are different stages we are at. We are not like in the high stages at, at once uh, so we can climb up the stairs on the ladder. Uh, so basically here's like cognition uh, which is like the major, is it, it's not even here, I don't know, it's yeah. cognitive. So uh, the cognitive is, is the leading line of development so the other lines cannot be higher than your cognitive level. But uh, developing all the aspects like, like needs, worldviews, values, your self-identity, you can become like a more whole person. With all these kind of personal development guess, quests, you, you, you engage yourself with the hero's journey in a way. I mean, 
it all starts with your intention. So think about what is your intention in developing yourself. Where do you want to go? What might be you know, the best research out there, the best experts? Use those, not just your gut feeling, but, but look outside, learn more about the world and how it works and how your body works and what is your relationship to that and put your intention to it because only through that intention that you put into every day, every morning you wake up, it might be my wristband that tells me, you know, vibration is not a bad thing. So somehow, you know, there are... How many euros? Yeah. <laughs> I've been vibrating three times during the yeah. presentation. But the main yeah. point is that if you transform yourself, you're going to transform others. Yeah. Stack the odds in your favor. Thank you. Thanks.